Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all this evening. I want to talk this evening about how we make sense of the world. And I want to answer this question in relation to the studio. And when I talk about the studio, I want to talk about it both as a physical space and as a metaphoric space. The physical space in which we move around an artist has on the walls of the studio, as will be familiar to many of you, newspaper cuttings, sketches, emails, items cut out of newspapers, a physical surrounding of thoughts. It's as if the walls of the studio become like a mirror of different thoughts going through the head of the artist. And one can think of the studio in a more metaphoric sense as an enlargement of the skull. So whereas in the skull you might have a three centimeter movement of an um, impulse from one part of your brain to another to bring it out of the memory into the current thought to make an association of something you've seen to another impulse to something that you've heard to that part of the cortex. In the same way in the studio as one walks around with say an eight meter walk rather than a three centimeter journey one is going from one idea to another idea, to the drawing that was started yesterday that's going to be completed, to the memory of a phone call that you've just had, to the anticipation of what's going to happen in the afternoon. All of these things are physically around you in the studio, and the activity of the artist in the studio is taking these different fragments and out of these constructing some object or some song or some drawing or some performance that will leave the studio and go out. So in brief terms one can say that the world is invited into the studio and there it is chopped up, fragmented, um, rearranged and then in some new form sent back out into the world. And what the studio demonstrates, which I'll be talking about further, is that the processes which are natural in the studio, the processes which are obvious in the activity of making artworks in the studio, which are visible and natural, in some ways reveal processes that we all have, but which are invisible in the way in which we make sense of the world. So I will answer both in relation to the physical and metaphoric space, but I will show it in relation to materials and activity. What are the processes that happen inside the studio in the transformation of materials from one form to another, in the migration of images from one form or one material to another, and what that shows us of ourselves and of the world. Now, I've spoken about the world being invited in and fragmented and then rearranged and sent out, and I suppose the central idea of this would be the idea of collage. And collage one thinks of as a 20th century art form of taking newspapers, fragments of clippings and cuttings, and particularly in a cubist way, rearranging an image of the world. But collage as a process of art making obviously has a much, much longer history. One thinks of all the historic and religious paintings which are made up out of a collage of details which have been made in artists' sketchbooks over centuries. So Rembrandt would get his different students to pose in different positions and do drawings of them and then construct a religious or a history painting by putting these different figures together. Caspar David Friedrich, who painted what one sees as these extraordinary landscapes, in fact constructs them out of sketches he's made of this branch and that trunk and that fragment of that tree and that alpine hut, and the collage is put together. But the difference in the 20th century, the difference in what I suppose is fundamentally the heart of modernism, is not just that one takes a fragmented world and gives an illusion of coherence to it, but that there is a celebration of the fragmentation itself. And that, in other words, what one shows and what collage shows is the very activity we have of making a possible coherence out of what is fundamentally a series of fragments. And rather than trying to hide this into a seemingly seamless canvas, the work itself shows the process we go through in constructing a, a collage. It means that we accept the falsehood to try to get closer to different truths. 
But the studio is also a physical space of movement, of physical movement across the space. There's a psychoanalytic term of Tummelplatz, which refers really as the psychoanalytic space between an analyst and the patient, which is a space both of jousting, as the Tummelplatz was, where knights would joust against each other, or where tumblers, gymnasts would do tumbling, a Tummelplatz for tumbling. So it's a place of contestation, but it's also a space of lightness and play, of giving an impulse the benefit of the doubt. In psychoanalytic terms of following free association rather than clear rational exposition, not in the belief that free association in itself is the virtue, but that through it one may well arrive at kinds of knowledge and understanding that otherwise would be hidden. And in the studio it also means giving the image and the impulse the benefit of the doubt, not interrogating something before it is done to know how it can justify itself, but allowing that the impulses from within us which we're half aware of are enough to provoke an image which we can then assess as it emerges. And this, this analogy, and it's a very thin analogy between the artist studio and the psychoanalytic space, does have various other echoes. In psychoanalytic terms, we're always dealing with the secondary revision. We're not dealing with the dream you actually have, but we can only dream with the dream that you remember, the dream that you tell yourself as you are waking. So there are different fragments that may have been zooming through your head, but in the moment of waking, there's a, a, a narrative order that is put through, and you construct it as if there is a story. And this is the material that the analyst has to work with. In the same way, when you're working with these different fragments and putting different elements of different images together to make a single image, it's not to say that is the only way it could be done, but that is the way that it emerges, and that is the raw material with which one has to then, has to then work. But there's also a sense in this Tummelplatz of, on the one hand, you have the analyst, on the other hand, you have the patient. You have these two minds thinking about the problem that circles in the space between them in the room. And in the, in the studio, you have a similar split of the, of the artist. So you have the artist making the drawing confronted by the sheet of paper trying to work out where a horizon line should be, what's the first impulse, trying to get the scale of the sheet of paper confronted with that, waiting for the impulse to draw it to start and the first images to be made on the sheet of paper. Somewhere between a vague presentiment of what an image might be and also putting different beacons on the sheet of paper which, from which one will construct the image. And this is a close confrontation with the sheet of paper, but very quickly, a second figure enters the, enters the room. And this is the critical self that stands back and looks at the drawing as it's done and can say to the person who's been doing to the drawing, you know, what a feeble drawing. You can see immediately it's in the wrong position. The belly of the rhinoceros should be lifted. You know, if he'd just stepped back and could see it. And there's a sense of confrontation. It's always, almost always one of disappointment. The one who comes in to look, who steps back from the drawing, is disappointed with what the other has managed to do and feels he ought to be able to do it so much, so much better. And instructions are given and the drawing self gets back to the work at the coal face of the paper making the drawing. You can see, it's very clear if you just look at it from a distance that the back of that rhinoceros is much too high and should be pushed down. The tail, the tail and the shoulder. And remember, lift the belly, get the head longer and the, the horn should be in a better position. In fact, there, there are many very good books and references. If you would just spend the time to study how Dürer had drawn a rhinoceros, it would be very easy to get it right. And there are other more accurate anatomical drawings of rhinoceroses. And he's saying, just, just take my advice. Just suck. Just suck off out of it. Okay. Suck off and just look at the there rhinoceros. Look, look, look here. You can see that it's wrong. You need to reach. You need to... 
And this confrontation, this, this clash between the physical sense of yourself making the drawing and stepping back and looking at that split of the subject becomes a very obvious part of what it is to be in the studio making, making the work. So there's a thinking in material and there's a free association of material. What a particular material you're working with suggests and ways of working with it. But there's also a migration of images from one medium into another as a way of provoking a different set of thoughts. So to give an example of this, I'll show some drawings, the process of constructing a particular body of work. So there were a series of drawings made, three-dimensional drawings made with black paper cutouts with an idea of making a stereoscopic image, of taking two photographs of the same three-dimensional drawing to make a stereoscopic illusion of a, of a print or a drawing. So these were all different examples of three-dimensional drawings being done on a table. That shows the way in which the table was arranged that you could actually take a, two photographs that had a sense of depth in it. And this was one project that had to do about the nature of an illusion of depth that we construct in our heads out of two flat images, which has to do with our understanding of our agency in seeing. We know we're seeing two flat images, but in our brain we believe the illusion of depth that we, that we make. Um, it's both the pleasure of making these particular objects and drawings. That's always an important part of the process. There always has to be a meeting of an idea or an impulse, in this case, making completely patently obvious the agency we have, our inability to stop ourselves from creating this illusion of depth through binocular vision, even though we know that it's a falseness. You know that you're looking at two flat images, but your brain believes it's seeing something in, in depth. So that's something that the studio does very obviously, but which is invisible to us. When I'm looking at you here, I'm not thinking, this is in flat, a flat image that my left eye is seeing and a flat image that my right eye is seeing and my brain is putting the two together to make me believe I'm seeing this depth. We take the depth for granted when we look. When you do that as an etching or a drawing, you're very aware that you're looking at a flat drawing or a flat etching and that it can only be in your brain that this illusion of depth is, is given. So this started as a, as a project about the the pleasures of playing with that, both about what it is to make a sculptural drawing, a drawing in three dimensions, and then to play with how that works in one's brain when it becomes a photograph. But from this I became interested in some of the torn, um, cut-out shapes, these very simple shapes. And these shapes started shifting and found a different life. So the shapes are very simple, they're roughly torn, they're uh, not quite random images, but torn as those shapes are there, and then arranged to try to find the logic of the, of the shape that's being made. In this case, a circle with a head that's put on it, and if two sticks are put underneath it, you have this illusion of a man that is, a fat man that is walking, or the world on its hind legs. And then learning the grammar of the piece is learning what the shifting of the positions of the angular angle of the head or the body or the legs provoke. These, these torn out pieces of paper then turned into these flat sculptures, flat sculptures made out of sheets of paper which were then arranged in rows and they started becoming a piece of text, almost like a series of glyphs or hieroglyphs. And from these flat paper cutouts, the idea became of trying to see what happened if they gained a certain heft or weight. So they turned from flat paper cutouts into wax, wax objects based on the shape of those paper cutouts. Partly in the sense that those paper cutouts were going to fall over and collapse, a way of giving them a kind of a weight and giving the words or the lines of text a kind of weight. So again, the practical work in the studio here was going from the sheet of paper to working out 
what kind of wax, what kind of material gets put with it. Do we use a polyurethane foam to get the thickness and then cover it with a black wax and working with a soft wax so it's both got a sense of hand imprint on it. Mm -hmm. And thinking also of it as a kind of printed text, if one took a piece of text or writing or a font and turned that into a fat object with weight. So they changed from being the images for a drawing to these two-dimensional paper cutout sculptures to these wax sculptures that were had depth if not weight. And then the final state was transferring, transforming them from wax into bronze. So they became a series of cast, if not letters, if not fonts, then possible ideas. Not to say that they have to make a coherent sentence when put together, but what they show is the possibility of constructing a chain of thoughts through having those different objects lined up and next to each other. So it expands from this project about depth of viewing to a project about a kind of encyclopedia of images and glyphs that might mean something. And that's about the pressure for meaning. Even though we can't say what the sentence is, in those sculptures there's a sense of a possibility of making sense. They hover at the edge of making sense. And this for me is always one of the interesting things. What is the nature of a riddle? A riddle that solves itself immediately loses its interest. So you have the famous riddle of the Sphinx, what goes on four legs at, uh, in the morning, goes on two legs in the afternoon and three legs in the evening. And we know this is a riddle about the age of a person going from childhood to decrepitude. And that immediately loses its interest as a riddle. But what stays as a riddle, of course, is the idea of a Sphinx itself, the strange half woman, half lion, creature and trying to know what that could be. So the riddles that we can't solve are the ones that keep, that keep gnawing at us, that keep our interest as if we ought to be able to find a finality of understanding. And in so many things I'm sure that we read, in pictures that we look at, it's those unsolved riddles in a painting, in a drawing, in a, the lines that don't make sense in a piece of music, the non sequiturs, the incompletions, the imperfect translations that hold us and keep us coming back and back. And the question of language and sense, making sense of the world and imperfect understanding of the world becomes uh, very important. Where a sentence propels us towards meaning, but often leaves us before we can make a complete sense of it. So this takes us into the field of allegory, where we say one thing, but we mean another. Or to parapraxis, where a word and a sound are slightly out of alignment and show us to a completely different hidden meaning. We have to complete the meaning as if. And the virtues of an imperfect translation, the virtues of an incomplete understanding, is what it shows us is our desire, our irresistible desire, to make sense of the world. The fact that we take different fragments and from them combine them into something to show a way that we might be able to make sense of the world. So to give a, an example to explain how this impulse works. Um, a few years ago, two friends of mine, I phoned two friends of mine who work together and I said to Basil, who's the partner of Adrian, I said to Basil in the course of the conversa conversation, oh, what is uh, Adrian doing? And Basil said, Adrian's uh, doing a tree search. And I thought, okay, tree search, tree search, what is a tree search? And then of course, of course a tree search is a internet term for searching down a subject. You put in the keyword and that's the trunk of your tree and then you can follow different branches and you search them out and connect from one smaller twig or you come back down the branch if that's wrong and you make another branch and they're different 
boxes with pieces of information that make up the leaves of the tree. That's a tree search. And at the end of the conversation, I said to Basil, oh, and what is Adrian researching? And he said, what do you mean, what is he researching? I said, you said he was doing a tree search. He said, no, I didn't. I said he was making a t-shirt. <laughs> so what happens in that moment? I hear the word tree search, and I register that I don't know what it is. And there's a panic about not knowing what it is. There's a super ego saying, you're a fool, you're stupid. Here's a term, you don't know what it must be. And then the self at the drawing board responds saying, oh, no, I do. I'll tell you what it is, and makes up this complete hokum idea of this internet search and branches and trees and trunks. And in a millisecond has constructed this whole hypothetical world of what a tree search might be. So it's not just about an agility of mind. It's a terror of incomprehension that provokes a kind of panic. And out of panic, as we know, is always the source of, of metamorphosis, of transformation. In all the Ovid poems about metamorphosis, there's always a panic somewhere. And from that terror and panic, there's the energy and the impulse to resolve it through turning into a tree, turning into a bird, uh, through the process of metamorphosis, of transformation. So there's something in us about the, the need and the desire to make sense of the world that is very central to who we are, which means that when one does a half-finished drawing or an imperfect object, it's, both about, it's not simply about a generosity of a viewer trying to make sense of it, but there's also something within us that as our very being, as if our being depended upon it, tries to complete and make coherent that which is presented to us. So we have words that make clear sense to us, and there are words that we could construct a meaning for, and there are other phrases and words that are obviously just like noise. The brain doesn't make a connection. We lose interest. They pass us by. So, there, so this is about a memory of a childhood dream. And the bicycle that I never had in the dream has lasted all these years. And by that, I mean that we have a sense hovering at the edge of our taste buds. We pause, we pause. It's as if there is an impulse, a pressure for meaning. And you can, you can feel this almost in your, in your armpits, underneath your armpits, in the pectoral muscles, this impulse, in your taste buds at the back of your, at the back of your throat. The words approach the meaning, but do not quite reach it. And predictable phrases start to unpredict. The information becomes a deformation, a, de a deformation. The words go on a foraging trip. They're hunter-gathering for images to make sense. It's as if somewhere in the margins there is the proof of the theorem. And you wait, and you wait. And if only there was time to write down this proof of the theorem. But who could have predicted it? Who could have predicted it? It comes as such a surprise. We have to defend the life-saving unnecessary. Now, these phrases that you've seen, in fact, didn't start as phrases. They started because I was given the gift of a beautiful watercolor block of lapis lazuli color from lapis lazuli from Afghanistan. And I was looking for a use for this beautiful watercolor blue. And the phrases emerged really as a way of testing the purity and the color of that blue with sets of almost free associative images. But at the end, one's left with something that hovers half between with an activity that hovers halfway between reading and looking, trying to make sense of those different phrases. And of course, with each of those, there are associations which I would know and which make complete sense to me. And one can write a paragraph about each of those particular phrases and their sense. And that's a kind of way in which biography is always part of making sense of the world. That it's not like a clear understanding that meets the world as it comes towards us, but it's always a whole series of private sets of associations, memories, different stories that meet the world as it comes towards us. But nonetheless, even without those particular stories, like my red bicycle did refer to the first dream I can remember when I was three years old of a bicycle next to my parents' bed. And when I woke up, there was no bicycle. And I've been waiting for that bicycle for 60 years. 
But there's something about a blue text saying a red bicycle, and that's kind of enough to start something off. History on one leg, the phrase refers to the toy toy, a particular kind of protest dance in South Africa in the 1980s and 90s. But it also, in a strange way, would refer to the Jewish sage who was asked to tell someone what is the meaning of the books of Moses and tell me while I stand on one leg. And that's giving the answer while one stands on one leg. I think the answer was something to the effect of uh, either do no harm to others or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the point is that as a phrase arises, we bring our own particular sets of associations to see what it could possibly mean. Now, a second thing I want to talk about tonight, and we'll come back to where we've been in the studio, has to do with a small project I started a year ago now in Johannesburg in a way to test some of these ideas, to allow these ideas to have a place to flourish. And it's called the, the Center for the Less Good Idea. And it's a small art center in and around my studio in Johannesburg. And it comes from this Tswana proverb. If the good doctor can't cure you, find the less good doctor. When good ideas lead you astray, hunt for the less good ideas. Practically, it means that there's a space in which actors, artists, musicians are invited to come together for two seasons a year to work together to see what the provocations are of different mediums coming together, of a poet working with a musician, working with a choreographer. And the idea of it has to do with the skepticism of the good idea. And in a purely practical studio sense, often when you start a project, you start with a good idea, maybe even a very good idea, something that's very clear. But as you start to work, to make the drawing, the film, the piece of theater, having gathered all the forces to realize the good idea, as the work begins, often the certainty of this good idea starts to falter. Its logic, which was very clear when written down, which looked great in the proposal, falters when you put it on stage. And then what stakes starts to take its place are all the images and ideas at the edges. So someone's sitting waiting for the entrance at the edge of a theater while someone in a boardway is drumming at the other edge of the stage. And suddenly one recognizes a possible tension between those two, those two facts. And that starts to come into the stage. Things that were peripheral ideas, right at the edge, start to come towards the center. And in the same way that walking around the studio, you've got a peripheral vision, seeing the different images which are pinned to the walls of the studio, in the same way that there's this peripheral vision, there's a kind of peripheral thinking where half-formed ideas, things you're not certain about, which nag at you, start to gather an energy to come and take their place in the center. It's as if these ideas are hovering at the edge, too timid to come into the middle to face the strength of the good idea. A hand cautiously raised, if I might make a suggestion, Hard thinking going on here, says the good idea. Just let me be. And the periphery tries to get a single word in. Uh, if I wonder if I could, the center says, the good idea says, just let me finish. So the ideas at the edge roll their eyes and try to find a corner to come in. It's as if the good idea is this great big light bulb and these peripheral ideas at the edge are these small flickerings of a single match. But sometimes what one finds is one has to switch off that big idea to allow the match light to gather and to make the idea happen. Practically, this means a series of workshops which culminate every six months in a series of performances to show people what has been found, what has been attempted. So far, we've had two seasons of it. The second season finished uh, only three days ago, so I don't have any material for that from that season to show you. But I want to show some extracts, four short extracts, from the first season of the Center of the Less Good Idea in Johannesburg. Almost all of them had to do with what I was talking before about the edge of making sense with the voice, of language, of where language falters, of what one can do without language, of giving an impulse towards meaning the benefit of the doubt. 
The first piece was an extract from a series of Samuel Beckett oh, plays that we world. did. This world, tiny little. Um, performed by an actor in Johannesburg. Into this, out into this, before her time, godforsaken hole, cold, cold. Find herself in the dark, and is not exactly insentient, insentient, that she could still hear the buzzing, so-called, in the ears, and a ray of light came and went, came and went, such as the moon might cast, drifting in a lot of cloud, but so dulled, feeling, feeling so dulled, she did not know what position she was in. Imagine what position she was in. With the standing or sitting, but the brain, what? Kneeling, yes, with the standing or sitting or kneeling, but the brain, what? Lying, yes, with the standing or sitting or kneeling or lying, but the brain still, still in a way. For her first thought was, oh, long after, sudden flash, brought up as she had been to believe, with the other waifs in a merciful, <laughs> God! <laughs> the second piece I'll show you was. Uh we had a series of events in a boxing ring put in the studio, which was a stage both for theatre plays, for a Soyinka play, and for other performances. This was a piece called Fall and Recover, where language disappeared entirely. was an orchestra called the Blind Mass Orchestra, where instead of having a musical score, there were texts given. So here language is used in the place of a musical score with instructions for musicians to improvise around and against. understood what's funny about this part. <laughs> Thank you. 
And the, the final extract is of a dance piece called Requiem Request, based somewhat on the bolero. Those were all extracts from the first season of the Center of the Less Good Idea. So what is it that one is learning? I said, what does one learn from the studio? How does one make sense of the world from it? And obviously there are things that the artist learns, the nature of the conversation with the material, with the conversation with the drawing as it emerges, which in a way becomes a self-portrait of long durée. In the end, if you take the total works that you've made over 40 years in the studio, in a way that's a portrait of who you are. But what does an audience learn? What is there for someone not in the studio to learn from the studio? And I would suggest that what can be learned is about the nature of the construction of meaning. And that what is normally invisible becomes inescapable in the studio. So for example, that disc of the head and the legs of the fat man walking. So we see two things there. We see the torn pieces of paper that are clear. We've seen how it's made. But we also are aware that we're seeing, our brain is seeing a fat man with a hat on his two thin legs. And then we see a metaphorical extension, which is to say it can't maybe not just only a man with a hat on his head walking, but it's also the world itself on its two legs walking across history. And then the third thing is that we become aware of this construction of this construction that we are making. We know we're only looking at two pieces of paper, but we stand behind ourselves and see ourselves constructing this fiction of it being a person, the world on its hind legs. And then the fourth thing that we get is we understand an agency of making sense of the world, of possibility, of provisionality, an acknowledgement of the biographical of ourselves in what we think of as objective fact. And this 
acknowledgement, I suppose, of the fallibility of the personal biographical in every statement that purports to be an objective story about the world gives us pause to all statements of authority, to all certainties, to the very idea of the solidity of the good idea. In that first season, we did a lot of work with language, and one couldn't help but think of the Dadaists and their project a hundred years ago now of taking apart a logic, saying if this is a logic which has brought us to the cataclysm of the First World War, we need an anti-logic. We need a way of being in the world that does not give priority to this positivist way of logical argument. It's both an epistemological imperative, because the way of understanding the world assumes an objectivity and an authority that is a false one, that is only maintained through the power of a gun, through the exercise of violence. But it also becomes a moral imperative. It also has an ethical dimension to it, of giving uncertainty and provisionality a place in how we structure and think about the world, of finding a place for the less good, for smaller, for peripheral ideas to affect how we operate in the world. To understand that contradiction and paradox are not mistakes at the edge of understanding, but deeply central to how we understand the world. To allow the periphery to come into the center. To understand the inadequacy of language that purports to show the world as it is. And one of the ways to do that, and one of the ways that was shown to an extent in the center, of, in the season of the center of the less good idea, is to show, in fact, this inadequacy through a performance of incoherence rather than coherence. And there's one of the great works of the 20th century was a, a long sound poem, Words Without Sense, made by Kurt Schwitters in the 1920s, um, his Ursonata. And I'd like to conclude with a section of the Ursonata of Kurt Schwitters. This is part of an ongoing project looking at all of these questions and images. Fums povota sa u pogif qui e o Bibe fumsbe, r bibe fumsbe, bibe fumsbe vata, bo fumsbe vata za, bo fumsbe vata za u, fumsbe vata za u, po gif qui e, te desen hm hm r ie mpf tilf tu til ju ka. Rinsekete bebe in skirmu zu enze zu rinskermu rakete bebe rumf tilf tu zu enze zu in skirmu zu enze zu rinskermu rakete bebe rakete bc fums povata za u u cd tb fums rakete rinsekete rakete rinsekete rakete rinsekete Rakete rinsekete, rakete rinsekete, rakete rinsekete, rakete rinsekete, rakete rinsekete, rakete rinsekete, b, b, f, b, v, fumspe, b, v, r, fumspe, v, b, v, r, ta, fumspe, v, ta, b, v, r, ta, ta, fumspe, v, ta, ta, b, v, r, ta, ta, u, fumspe, v, ta, ta, u, b, v, r, ta, ta, u, p. Fums bevertaza u p bevertaza u p gif. Fums bevertaza u p gif. Qui e. Rakete rinsekete. 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 B. B. F. Bever. Fumspe, bever. Fumspe, bevibber. Fumspe, bevibber, beveribber. Fumspe, bevibber, bever a tabber. Fumspe, a tabber, bever a tatabber. Fumspe, a tatabber, bever a tatar u, bepper. 
Fums be vata ta u be pe, be vata ta u pe ge. Fums be vata ta u pe ge, be vata ta u pe gif. Fums be vata ta u pe gif, kui e. Raketa rinsikita, 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 be. Puff-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-tilf-